dramaturgy is often discussed in metaphoric terms, and the most common one applied to the work of the dramaturg is navigation, which in its common domain is the activity of guiding oneself or a vehicle, most often a ship, as the term's etymology implies, along a route toward a goal. Dramaturgy is often also described as a pooling of ideas, a gathering of fluid components. Typically, however, discussion of dramaturgy implies a singular or a very limited relationship of subject to object, a single person, a dramaturg, or a dyad of director and dramaturg at the navigational helm, steering the developing work along a defined course toward a pre predefined goal, or drawing concepts together into a unified and coherent whole. In the case of devising ensembles, however, the language of dramaturgy, of which there is comparatively little, changes with differently nuanced metaphors coming into play. The Forsyth Company is one such devising ensemble. Dana Casperson, who has written about the company's working process, has compared the internal architecture of new Forsyth works to weather systems, drawing a comparison between clouds, which result from interactions between force and matter, and I quote, inherent forces that interact with the thoughts, energy, and bodies of the performers to shape the nature of its flow and the events that occur within it, unquote. Bill Forsyth himself has described the ensemble's dramaturgical and structural work in terms of sifting out of the network of resonant, internally logical ideas, essentials remain while non-essentials fall through. Finally, in an interview I conducted shortly after my arrival in Frankfurt in 2006, Steve Falk, who worked with Bill as dramaturg for Alien Action in 1992, evoked a vivid image of friction, heat, and light, saying, what Bill does in rehearsals is take different things and crash them together. The sparks are what goes into the piece. Weather-like systems of thought, bodies and energies, sieving out what is essential, and the brilliant results of collided ideas. I find it noteworthy that all three of these metaphors, rather than indicating measured motion toward a state of relative stasis, instead evoke images of elemental particles trajecting through space, through an open space. In what follows, I will be employing a slightly different metaphoric term that, though not premeditated as doing such, also sets objects into restless motion. Fielding, most commonly defined in reference to sports, such as the catch and return of a ball in play, is actually a much more polyvalent term, also describing aspects of military action and rhetorical practice. This polyvalency, I hope, will serve to frame features of the way that Forsyth and his ensemble collaborate to devise choreography and dramaturgy. And indeed, in Forsyth's work, no clear distinction can be made between these two terms. The works of the Forsyth Company, like those of the former Ballet Frankfurt, reflect arrays of ideas that emerged and continue to emerge from collaborative processes. Over the 30 years since Forsyth took direction of the Ballet Frankfurt, the ensemble has worked for numerous longer periods without any official dramaturg. This is certainly not to say that there was no dramaturging during those periods. Rather, dramaturgy in Forsyth's ensemble is a function that it dis is distributed across and even beyond the entire ensemble. And I hope that I'll be clarifying this to you enough as I go on. As Bill's, Dana's, and Steve Volk's comments indicate, Forsyth's dramaturgies involve proliferations of concepts and modes of action, or better said, concept-driven modes of action. From the earliest rehearsals for new works, the performers are tapped for ideas and elaborations of starting concepts. The beginnings of works, as Bill has commented, are arbitrary. It starts at any point, as he puts it. A choreographed phrase might serve as initial material, which, through the application of different constraints, generates a proliferation of diverse but related modes of moving. Spontaneous workshops, exploring or fine-tuning some movement skill, might also render up initial themes. Sometimes Bill invites discussion of a philosophical or scientific concept, fixes on a joke or gag that someone has made, or posits an outrageous scenario. At other times, though, rehearsals begin with the company simply shooting the breeze. Any of these can spin off into modes of physical making or the generation of text, which, of course, is also a physical mode of making. 
The rehearsals that begin the making phase are characterized by a playful but thoughtful exploratory quality and a complete lack of urgency, at least for me. <laughs> Bill? <laughs> Modes of moving are explored exhaustively through the application and compounding of different translations or constraints, what Bill in the past has termed algorithms. Over the first few days or weeks, depending on the length of the production period, several distinct registers may be brought into play. For example, for the 2011 work that would become Cider, rehearsals began with Bill holding mock interviews with the dancers, posing tongue-in-cheek questions as if the work had already been made six months prior. During these lighthearted sessions, an extensive list of neologisms was produced. Short, nonsensical sounding phrases like hooray gun and victory legumes that were extrapolated from the meandering discussion and from dancers' names. Bill then asked the dancers to select from these deliberately nonsensical terms and map them first onto paper and then into studio space. After several days of mapping, Bill had the ensemble work with large sheets of thick armored cardboard, seeing what kinds of movement, sound, and interaction were possible with them. Next, a rhythmic and rather ridiculous text about wanting to sell you stuff was first made and then stamped out rhythmically with the feet. These arbitrary points, which are always explicitly bracketed by Bill as merely a means of setting the company into motion, thus serve to seed a field of ideas or one could say to field a battalion of concepts. Though sometimes left behind in favor of other associated ideas and processes, these initial materials often do return later and inform the resulting performance in unexpected ways. In the case of Cider, associations to Hamlet haunted the work from the very first rehearsal, unnoticed up to the point where their accumulation became evident. And these are the moments where the company tends to go do 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 Twilight Zone theme. And Bill, never being one to resist chance occurrences, chose not long afterwards to invite Shakespeare's play into, in a more concrete manner. Within the ensemble's distributed dramaturgy, different individuals play different positions, as it were, contributing in different manners, at different times, and in different amounts. Performers often initiate new concepts or registers of actions, fielding ideas by bringing in books, images, sound, or movements. This often happens late in the process, but Bill also often recalls things that individuals have, had done earlier. Not infrequently, these full-blown scenarios remain quite unchanged at premieres. One such danced instance of this sort of contribution is Fabrice Maslia's evocation of a Mediterranean tourist dancing on and on late at night in total oblivion. One of the opening images of the 2008 work, I Don't Believe in Outer Space, as well as a poignant fragment of the work's highly introspective dramaturgy. Others, including Dana Kasperson and Tillman O'Donnell, who is now affiliated with the company as a guest, often offer spoken content in this manner. On a side note, there are actually many more dramaturgical players in the field than the team of Forsyth, dancers, and myself, the so-called dramaturg. Additional contributions may be provided by musicians, technicians, former company members, students, or others who visit the studio. During rehearsals for I Don't Believe in Outer Space, for example, cognitive philosopher Alvin Noe, whose interests in embodied experience have led him to conduct research on and in dance making processes, spent several days in Frankfurt watching rehearsals and meeting with Bill and the ensemble dancers. Bill acknowledges Alva's ad hoc studio and private discussions of psychologist philosopher William James as having deeply informed the work and later dubbed Alva our semi-official philosopher in residence. During one of the earliest rehearsals for the 2011 work that became Cider, Bill sent him off with a group of dancers for a discussion, dubbing him a dramaturg. And any insecure dramaturgs in the audience might be able to imagine how unsettling a moment like that can be. At other times, Bill seems to speak in tongues, channeling former collaborators or visitors, some of whose voices I recognize and some who I do not, from beyond the studio into the process. In cases like this, it's quite possible that these invoked individuals are dramaturging without knowing it. Often, and I'll come back to this later, it isn't clear at all whether or not Bill is deploying something from farther afield. All of the ensemble's members, and this is where I come in, engage in the, in the practice of elaboration, working collectively but not necessarily coordinatively to further populate the field of possible options. 
For my own part, I contribute by op offering texts, uh, participating in discussions with the ensemble, and fleshing out impulses that emerge. However, I also follow my own curiosity, moving tangentially from document to document until some text resonates in a way I feel might inform the process. Whereas the dancers dramaturg with their bodies and on their feet, though, I do it from my chair, seldom venturing to illustrate ideas and movement, but that's a longer story. The elaborative process involves a tangible measure of challenge, grace under pressure, cockiness, speed, and style. Bill hosts a bracing game of round robin in which one never knows when, from where, or in what form an idea might be thrown your way. To be fielded and returned to the game, ideally bent like Beckham with a flashy spin on it. Anything is fair game, including random objects and chance events to which Bill seems irresistibly drawn and which occasionally come to underpin whole sections or even entire works. He tells the company, you know you have to be careful what you say and do in here because I will use anything. I have, though, occasionally wondered whether the, performance, uh, the performers might actually be colluding in the occurrence of chance events in the studio, and if so, how much. As I've described, the ensemble's working modus is strongly grounded in a collaborative exchange involving contributions to the field of working ideas and a catch and throw fielding dynamic of proliferation, translating ideas into more ideas. However, there is a further aspect of the ensemble's dramaturgical word that I feel bears discussion, given its effect on my particular position in the field as the official dramaturg. I can't speak for any of the other unofficial ones. And that will bring me to my final definition of fielding. It's that dramaturgies, in the sense of conceptual and movement modes that are developed and come into play, are not only commodities, but also in a certain sense property. Personal creations that for a variety of reasons, any given player might not wish for others to play with, or specific others to play with. This was particularly true, I found, when I went questioning early in my engagement with the company, looking for ways to gain footing and justify my presence by fielding the dramaturgies of others. I learned over time that not everyone in the ensemble is forthright in inviting dramaturgical engagement. Instead, I frequently found my dramaturgical questions being fielded in the sense of answered in manners that were strategically evasive and offered no real information beyond the message that I wasn't going to get a message. Over time, I learned who would play, who would discuss their dramaturgical thoughts with me and who not, as well as when and from what perspective. I also came to view the company's weak dynamic of dramaturgical communication, not only as a manifestation of individual autonomy, but also as a felicitous strategy, which in leaving words works dramatically, dramaturgically, in the air, unmoored and unbounded, also leaves them their most open to change. Bill, for his part, though, seems perfectly happy keeping the don't know mind, as the Buddhist adage goes, when it comes to what I refer to as danced dramaturgies. He might, for example, ask a dancer what they were thinking at a particularly effective moment, but then immediately recant and say, wait, I don't need to know. What's important is that it makes sense to you. Bill, may, Bill himself may wait for days or even months after premieres to discuss his own dramaturgical perspective, often talking about performances as if he only came to know them more fully in performance. And this is why I never schedule audience talks in the week of a new premiere. By way of explanation, he sometimes invokes Marcel Duchamp's conception of the artist as working in an intuitive state of channeling that the state of creation has a mediumistic aspect that defies logic in its own moment. I hope that I've been able to convey a notion of the ensemble's dramaturgical uh, work in using these terms of fielding, that positions of the creative team are not exclusive but are shared. Some of the features intrinsic to the ensemble's dramaturgical devising, seeding a field of potentials, fielding what comes at you with as much style and pleasure as the game allows. And for me, the work has meant acknowledging and, support, acknowledging and supporting the different playing styles of my fellow co-dramaturgs. Mm -hmm.